Synthesis of aldehydes and ketones is a common midpoint in many synthetic sequences that you are going to see in your course. So let's look at the most common reactions that you are going to need to know to ace your tests. There are four common strategies that you are most likely going to use when you need to make an aldehyde or a ketone. First, it's going to be the oxidation of primary or secondary alcohols. Next, we are going to look at the azanolysis of alkenes, then hydration or hydroboration of alkynes, which is also a very useful reaction, and probably something that you haven't seen yet, that is the partial reduction of carboxylic acid derivatives. If you're in the second semester of organic chemistry right now, you're most likely familiar with the first three methods and will learn the last one later this semester. And if you're reviewing it for your final, well, hopefully you remember them all. In any case, let's look at each of these methods and briefly discuss the important highlights of each reaction so that you know what to expect and how to use them. Let's start by looking at probably the most common method, which is going to be the oxidation of alcohols. We classify alcohols as primary, secondary, and tertiary. However, only primary and secondary alcohols can undergo oxidation, and tertiary alcohol cannot be oxidized any further. Primary alcohols can make either aldehydes or carboxylic acids, depending on the nature of the reagents you are using and the conditions. In the meantime, the secondary alcohols can only make ketones. So while it is irrelevant which oxidizing agent you are using for the secondary alcohol, you gotta be very careful with primary alcohols because they can give you two different products. If we want to stop at the formation of an aldehyde and not over-oxidize our primary alcohol to the carboxylic acid, we'll need, as I've mentioned a moment ago, to use a special conditions and reagents. The most common reagents that you are going to see for the oxidation of primary alcohols to aldehydes are going to be some something like PCC or PDC, the Swern oxidation, which is a two-step process, or Desmartin per iodinane. There are a few other methods that you might encounter if you dig a bit deeper into this topic, but these are the most commonly taught reagents in a sophomore course, so you definitely need to know PCC and Swern, and maybe if your instructor have covered that, then DMP as well. For our purposes, they are essentially interchangeable, so it doesn't matter which one you choose. Now, the next method is going to be the azanolysis of alkenes, and it is not nearly as popular as a synthetic technique because we typically look at it as a reaction that cuts through the carbon-carbon bonds rather than a reaction that creates a new functional group. Nonetheless, azanolysis is a fine method of making an aldehyde or a ketone um, that you can use when other methods are, you know, maybe not available for whatever reason, or maybe you need to cut some bonds in the process as well. Who knows what you might be needing to do during your synthesis. Most most commonly, you are going to be using this method when you are dealing with cyclic alkenes and you are needing to cut your ring open while making some carbonyls in the process. Many instructors like to use this trick as a starting point or even a key step on a synthesis on the test. So I'm willing to bet you are going to come across this reaction once or twice during this semester, and especially when working on complex uh, homework problems associated with synthesis, or maybe when you are prepping for the test and going over some sample questions from your instructor. One of my personal favorites that I've seen a million times on the tests and included in my own test when I was an instructor is the synthesis where we are going to start with cyclohexene and we are going to end up with cyclopentene with some functional groups or whatever else might be sitting on that. And the key step in this reaction is actually going to be the ozonolysis to cut through our double bond, form the corresponding alkene, and then go through the aldol condensation to reclose our ring, but now making a five-membered ring instead. Pretty cool, right? Now, moving to the next method, we have the hydration and hydroboration of alkynes. Alkynes, as you know very well, are pretty versatile functional group, and they are relatively easy to make via the alkylation reaction of alkynide anions. This is a typical SN2 reaction, and for as long as you have a primary alkyl halide over here, you can easily hang the uh, terminal alkyne on top of that. Now, due to the opposite regioselectivity of the hydration and the hydroboration reactions, we can easily synthesize either an aldehyde, if we are using the hydroboration, 
or we can do a ketone if we are doing the hydration of our alkynes. And interestingly enough, we can also get a decent regioselectivity with internal alkynes when we are using bulky boranes and one side of your molecule is significantly larger than the other side to cause sufficient steric uh, interference. So if I have this R as a very bulky group and I'm using a bulky borane, then during this reaction my bulky borane is going to orient itself away from the bulkier group, so I'm going to draw this borane over here with this parachute on it, so this is going to add oxygen onto the carbon, which is closer to the smaller group. So this way you can still control the regioselectivity of your reaction. Unfortunately, it's not that easy to put the oxygen on the more substituted carbon in this case, unless maybe you have some resonance effects or something like that, so while it is possible, it is not that easy. So coming back to the general idea of this type of a reaction, while this method is not as universal and as straightforward as, let's say, an oxidation of alcohols, it can still be very useful in some situations. So it's still a good idea to keep this method in your synthetic toolkit. And finally, we have one last method you should know, which is a partial reduction of carboxylic acid derivatives. Typically, what I see most students do when they need to convert, let's say, a carboxylic acid into a corresponding aldehyde, I would see that they would first completely reduce the carboxylic acid into the corresponding alcohol, and then they would oxidize that alcohol with something like PCC, Swern, or whatever else to get the corresponding aldehyde. And while this is a fine sequence and it gets the job done, it's far from efficient. There is, however, a way you can do this transformation directly by using reagents like DBAL-H, which stands for the diisobutyl aluminum hydride, at usually low temperatures. Usually we are talking about like negative 78 or so, because if we have higher temperature, then uh, this reaction is uh, going to be a little bit too violent. This reaction works for esters and acid chlorides, and it affords you an aldehyde in one synthetic step, which is significantly more efficient. And for the reference here, dbal H is this guy over here, I drew it in a corner. There are a few other versions of this reaction and a few modifications of the reducing agent itself itself, so you might see some other versions too. If you are curious, you might want to look up this reaction and uh, see some other variations as well. However, within the scope of a typical sophomore organic chemistry course, we usually limit ourselves just to dbal H and maybe a couple of other versions of that. So to wrap it up, when you are going to be looking at making an aldehyde or a ketone, you are most likely going to be making it from the corresponding alcohol. You can also use alkenes, alkynes, and even carboxylic acid derivatives to make your aldehydes and sometimes ketones as well, depending on the structure of your molecules. This list is, of course, far from exhaustive. There are other methods that can afford carbonyls. Specifically, you can make ketones via the Grignard reaction with nitriles or by reacting organolithium compounds with carboxylic acids. Those reactions will kill two birds with the same stone by not only making the carbonyl that you want, but also creating a new carbon-carbon bond. But that's a topic for another conversation. So if you don't want to miss that, make sure you subscribe to the channel, boop the like button if you've learned something new today, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time!